Chapter 9 of Man and His Ancestor, A Study in Evolution. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Mack, Tucson, Arizona. Man and His Ancestor, A Study in Evolution by Charles Morris. Chapter 9, The First Stage of Human Evolution. The question has often been asked, if man has descended from an ape ancestor, why is it that no traces of this ancestral form have been found in a fossil state? If man has gone through such an extended course of development, why has he left no remains? This question, looked upon as unanswerable by many of those who ask it, is really of minor importance. A half dozen answers, each of considerable weight, could easily be made to it. In the first place, it may be said that the absence of remains referred to is far from a single instance, but one out of thousands. It is generally admitted that the species of animals found fossil are very far from representing all the species that have existed upon the earth, and probably form but a minute percentage of them. In the second place, the remains of man's ancestor have not been sought for its native locality, the tropical regions. In the third place, man belongs to the class of animals least likely to be preserved in the fossil state, since they dwell in the depths of forests and at a distance from the lakes and streams whose muddy bottoms the remains of so many animals have been fossilized. Another answer is that of the various species of anthropoid apes that probably existed in the past, a few relics only of a single species have been found. If there were this one species alone, its number of individuals must have reached into the millions. Yet of those hosts, only a few fugitive bones are known to exist. There could not well be a more striking instance of the imperfection of the geological record. The sparse remains of Diropithecus, the species in question, with some few other fossils of doubtedly anthropoid species, save us from a total blank, and open the vista to a myriad of active arboreal creatures which had their dwelling place in the old-time European forests, but have almost utterly vanished from human knowledge. These are not the only answers that can be made to the question propounded. Though the bones of the man-ape have not been found, relics of several stages of developing man exist. Most significant among these, until recently, was the celebrated Neanderthal skull, which in facial aspect departs widely from the ordinary human and approaches the simian type. More significant still is the Ithacanthropus cranium, indicative of an animal that stood midway between man and ape, a creature fully erect in posture, as its thigh bone proves, but with a brain that had attained but the halfway stage of development, in this notable find, we seem to see man in the making, the body already fully manlike, the brain advanced much beyond the stage of the ape intellect, but still far below that of man. It is the remnant of a creature significantly on the dividing line between man-ape and man. So much for the response to the question as hitherto made. As the case stands, we are not obliged to stop at this point. Within the latter section of the 19th century, Discoveries have been made which fit in admirably with our argument. Rediscoveries, perhaps we should call them, for they were imperfectly known in ancient times, but only recently have they fairly come within human ken. We refer to the pygmy tribes of the African forests, not definitely offered hitherto as aids to the elucidation of this problem, yet which seem to adapt themselves closely to it and certainly help essentially in filling the gap between civilized man and his ape-like ancestor. We have already said that there appear to have been two separate and distinct stages in the evolution of man, one that of his conflict with animal world, ending in his mastery of the brute creation, the second that of his conflict with nature, ending in his mastery of the resources of the earth. Overlapping and succeeding the second, there has been a third, that of the conflict of man with man, ending in the survival of the fittest of the human race. In the discussion of this problem as hitherto made, these distinct stages of evolution, with their intermediate resting stages, have not been recognized. 
argument being based on man as a whole and no thought directed to the possibility that existing man may represent several separate processes of development with broad lapses between the argument we propose to offer is that man as he was at the completion of the first stage that of the subjugation of the animal world and before the beginning of the conflict with nature still exists the first derivation of the man-ape living in the location and possessing much of the appearance and many of the habits of this ancestral form late travelers in africa have found more than trees and streams in the forest depths they have found there a distinct and peculiar race of men negro-like in many particulars yet differing from the negroes in others and specially marked by their dwarfish stature which is indicated in the name of pygmies usually given them these diminutive beings were known as long ago as the days of homer and their legendary combats with the cranes are spoken of him in his poems he was not aware of what is known now that these forest dwarfs would disdain the cranes as antagonists and are quite capable of overcoming the lordly elephant in truth they know no equals in the forest and while destitute of any knowledge of agriculture are the most skillful considering the primitive nature of their weapons of the hunters of the earth the forest is the home of the pygmy as in all probability it was of the man ape he dwells in his deepest recesses its moist and sultry depths and pines when removed from his native realm in the heart of the tropic woods in truth he is almost as fully arboreal as was his tree-dwelling ancestor and are his forest relatives the anthropoid apes of today not inhabiting the limbs of trees indeed but living under their shade and forming the true man of the woodland the nomad hunters of the vast equatorial forests it must be said however that this is not wholly the case there are tribes seemingly belonging to this race in south africa who dwell in the open desert but retain there in great measure the habits of their forest kin the first of modern travelers to see the pygmies was du chelieu in his journey through the african woodlands in eighteen sixty seven he describes them as averaging four feet seven inches in height their complexion of a pale yellow brown the hair of their head short but their bodies covered with a thick growth of hair as if the loss of their ancestral covering had not been completed the tribe seen by him was known as the obongo and dwelt in a shango land occupying the forest region between the gaboon and the congo dr schweinfurth whose exploration extended from eighteen sixty eight to eighteen seventy was the next to meet these nomads of the forests of whom he has given an interesting description in his quote, heart of africa end quote. he met with them in the country of the manbuto on the well river between three degrees and four degrees north latitude the tribe seen by him known as the aka was made up of very diminutive individuals none being over four feet ten inches high and some only four feet their bodies were in due proportion to their height so that they resembled half-grown boys in size the akas as described by him have large heads huge ears and very prognathous faces their arms are long and lank the chest flat and narrow widening below to support a huge hanging abdomen the legs short and bandy and the walk a waddling motion there being a sort of lurch with each step in this latter respect they recall the gibbon in its effort to walk the gapping aspect of the mouth has a suggestive resemblance to that of the ape they are also ape-like in their incessant play of countenance twitching of eyebrows rapid gestures of hands and feet nodding and wagging of the head and remarkable agility their skin is of a dull brown color like partly roasted coffee and destitute of the covering of hair seen by dr chedu on the obongos the hair of the head and the beard is scanty and of woolly texture stanley who frequently met these forest dwarfs in his expedition for the relief of Emin pacha gives much more information concerning his quote, in darkest africa end quote. he found indeed two types of dwarfs one the wambuti who were of attractive aspect having large round eyes full and prominent round faces with broad foreheads 
jaws slightly pugnacious hands and feet small figures well formed though diminutive and complexion of a brick red hue the other type the aka he describes as having small cunning monkey eyes close and deeply set one woman described by him had quote, protruding lips overhanging her chin a prominent abdomen narrow flat chest sloping shoulders long arms feet strongly turned inward very short lower legs end quote. she was quote, certainly deserving of being classed as an extremely low degraded almost bestial type of human being end quote. the language of the aka is of a very undeveloped type and seems a link between articulate and inarticulate speech stanley in his journey down the congo heard many stories of the forest dwarfs who were described to him as a yard high with long beards and large heads other traditional accounts of them similarly speak of their long beards though stanley saw none answering to this description the first individual seen by him in this journey was four feet six and a half inches high and measured thirty inches around the chest he was of a light chocolate color with a thin fringe of whiskers his legs bowed and with thin shanks the calf being undeveloped his body was covered with a thick fur-like hair nearly half an inch long in this respect agreeing with those described by du chelieu the batwas seen and measured by dr ludwig wolf in the middle congo basin in 1886 were of an average height of four feet three inches they resemble the aka in general appearance and have longish heads long narrow faces and small reddish eyes they bounded through the tall herbage quote, like grasshoppers end quote, and were remarkably agile in climbing for several years past there have been rumors of a race of pygmies in the interior of the cameroons but these reports were not verified until the year 1898 when the bulu expedition of german military force succeeded with much difficulty in seeing several individuals of this race secured through the aid of a native chief one woman was measured and proved to be just four feet high the color was from chocolate brown to copperish except the palms which were of yellowish white the hair was deep black thick and frizzled the skull broad and high the lips full and swollen like other pygmy tribes these are very shy wandering from place to place in the forest and avoiding frequented routes of travel they are skillful hunters and collect much rubber which they dispose of to the negro tribes in the same year mr albert b lloyd made a journey in central africa following stanley's route down the congo he was alone with the exception of a few carriers and had the good fortune of passing through the country of the pygmies and that of the cannibals of the arumi without conflict or injury entering into cordial relations with both peoples he journeyed for three weeks in the pygmy forest and had excellent opportunities for examining its inhabitants after entering the great primeval forest mr lloyd went west for five days without the sight of a pygmy suddenly he became aware of their presence by mysterious movements among the trees which he at first attributed to the monkeys finally he came to a clearing and stopped at an arab village where he met a great number of the diminutive nomads quote, they told me end quote, says mr lloyd quote, that unknown to me they had been watching me for five days peering through the growth of the forest they appeared very much frightened and even when speaking covered their faces i asked a chief to allow me to photograph the dwarfs and he brought a dozen together i was able to secure a snapshot but did not succeed in the time exposure as the pygmies would not stand still then i tried to measure them and found not one over four feet in height all were fully developed the women somewhat slighter than the men i was amazed at their sturdiness the men have long beards reaching halfway down the chest they are very timid and will not look a stranger in the face their bead-like eyes constantly shifting they are it struck me fairly intelligent i had a long talk with a chief who conversed intelligently about their customs in the forest and the number of the tribesmen both men and women except for a tiny strip of bark were quite nude the men were armed with poisoned arrows the chief told me the tribes were nomadic and never slept two nights in the same place they just huddled together in hastily thrown-up huts 
memories of a white traveler, Mr. Stanley, of course, who crossed the forest years ago, still linger among them. End quote. The discovery of these forest pygmies has directed attention to the Bushmen of South Africa, a desert-dwelling race long known, though comparatively little regarded, in their ethological difference. They are now regarded as an outlying branch of the forest pygmies, the chief difference being in the shape of the skull, which is rather long in the Bushmen, rather short in the pygmies. These degraded wanderers inhabit an area extending from the inner ranges of the mountains of Cape Colony through the central Kalahari Desert to near Lake Nagami, thence northwestward to the Ovambu River. Into these, the most barren portions of the South African deserts, they have been driven by the encroachments of the Kaffirs, Hottentots, and Europeans. They closely resemble the Akka tribes of the north, averaging about four and a half feet in height and possessing deep-set crafty eyes, small and depressed nose, and a generally repulsive countenance. Their complexion is of a dirty yellow. Their hair grows in small woolly tufts. In the vicinity of Lake Nagami, Livingstone found them to be of larger stature and darker color, while Baines measured some in this region who were five feet six inches in height. In disposition, the Bushmen are strikingly wild, malicious, and intractable, while their cerebral development is classed by Humboldt as belonging to almost the lowest class of the human species. Close in affinity with the Bushmen, and in various respects unlike the dark races around them, are the Hottentots, the original inhabitants of Cape Colony, a race of herdsmen who are much superior in culture to the degraded desert nomads. They are not dwarfish, being of medium stature, but they resemble the Bushmen in complexion, in which, and in general cast of features, they present some similarity to the Chinese. Their hair, like that of the Bushmen, grows in tufts with spaces between, and they are like them in language, their method of speech consisting largely in a series of clicking sounds. Their manner of talking has been compared to the clucking of a hen, and by the Dutch to the gobbling of a turkey cock. The Hottentots present every appearance of being a developed branch of the pygmy family, or the result of a cross between Bushmen and Negroes. These tribes of dwarfs, now extended throughout the equatorial forests and over the South African deserts, were probably once far more widespread, inhabiting much of the continent and reaching as far as Madagascar, where a branch of them known as the Quinos or Quinas are thought still to exist. They extended north to the Mediterranean and have left their representatives in Morocco in a tribe of dwarfs about four feet high, who differ widely in appearance from all other people of that country. As to their origin, there is a diversity of opinion. Some anthropologists look upon them as a primeval race, distinct from the Negroes, who came among them later. Professor Virchow, on the contrary, is of the opinion that their only important difference from the Negroes is that of size, and regards them as the remains of a primitive population from whom the Negroes have descended. In a preceding section, a statement was made as to what was the probable general appearance of the man-ape. It was based upon the physical aspect of the pygmies, whom we hold to form the immediate derivative of man's ape ancestor and to have ape-like characteristics, which they still present. Mentally, they have made a very considerable advance and have reached the stage of men of low intellectual powers, but while their brains have been growing, their bodies have not greatly changed, and the marks of their origin are thick upon them. There has probably been little change in the size the diminutive stature and small bodily dimensions being in accord with their incessant activity, while the difficulties of traversing the thick growth of the tropical forest may have helped to keep them small. As it is, they are about half the size of civilized man, the weight of a full-grown adult male being probably not over 90 pounds. Taking the pygmies as a whole, it may be said that though many of the Akas are disproportionate in shape and tottering in gait. On the whole, these people are well made, their protuberant paunch being probably a result of their habits of eating. 
Captain Guy Burroughs says that a pygmy will eat twice as much as would suffice a full-grown man, and that one of them will devour a whole stalk of bananas at a meal with other food. Some tribes are described as physically and mentally degenerate, and prognosticism is in many cases strongly declared, the lower part of the face having an ape-like contour and the protruding chin, that feature peculiar to man, being very deficient. In their great abdominal development, the adult akaz resemble the children of Arabs and Negroes. This, therefore, seems the retention of a primitive feature which has become a passing characteristic in the more advanced types of mankind. The pygmies are not destitute of intelligence and are capable of receiving some of the elements of education. Two of them were brought to Italy about 1875, who within two years' time learned to read and write and to speak Italian with much fluency. They showed themselves superior in school studies to European children of 10 or 12 years of age, and one of them became somewhat proficient in music. In their habits, they resembled children, being sensitive and impulsive, fond of play, and very quick in their motions. Their readiness in gaining the elements of education is in accord with the experience in the case of other savages. It is when studies requiring abstruse thought are reached that the facility in acquisition of the savage races comes to an end. With this consideration of the characteristic and habitat of the pygmies, we may proceed to a review of their habits. The weapons which they seem to have developed during their long upward progress, and to which their supremacy over the wild beasts of the forest is probably due, consist of two, the bow and arrow and the spear. The bow and arrow are small and insignificant in appearance, and would be of little value but for the poison which the pygmies have somehow learned to obtain, and which makes them dreaded, not only by beasts, but by men. Wherever found, from the deserts of the south to the forest of the well and Arumi on the north, the poisoned arrow is a mark of affinity as decided in its way as their physical resemblance. Its wide distribution goes to indicate that it was the general weapon of the pygmies ages ago, when, presumably, they had all Africa for their own and ruled supreme over the animal world in that continent. It is true, indeed, that the use of the poisoned arrow is not peculiar to them, but is a somewhat common possession of savage tribes in all parts of the earth. This makes it quite possible that it was not original with the pygmies, but was derived by them from other tribes. On the other hand, in view of its great value in giving them supremacy over the lower animals, it may well have been a primeval pygmy invention, and these tribes the original source of its existing wide distribution. They possess more than one poison, one being a dark substance of the color and consistence of pitch, which is supposed to be made out of a species of arum. It is laid in the splints of their wooden arrows or spread thickly upon their iron arrowheads when they possess these. Another poison is a pale glue color, which is supposed by Stanley to be made of crushed red ants. When fresh, these poisons are deadly, producing excessive faintness, palpitation of the heart, nausea, and deep pallor, soon followed by death. In Stanley's experience, one man died within a minute, from a mere pinprick in the breast. Others lived during different intervals, extending up to 100 hours. The difference in virulence seemed to have depended on the degree of freshness of the venom, which apparently lost its strength as it became dry. The possession of a weapon so deadly as this, together with the agility and daring and the unerring marksmanship of the forest dwarfs, seem to give them absolute control of the animals of the African wilds. The lion, the elephant, and the buffalo, the largest and fiercest of the beasts of field and forest, are powerless before the virulent venom of the arrows of the pygmies, and doubtless for ages they have held dominion as the fearless rulers of wood and wild. Captain Burroughs says of the skill with the bow of the pygmy that, quote, he will shoot three or four arrows one after the other with such rapidity that the last will have left the bow before the first has reached its goal. End quote. The bow and spear are not their only means of obtaining food. They have certain of the arts of the trapper, perhaps original with them, 
perhaps borrowed from their larger neighbors. They sink pits in the pathways of their game, covering them with light sticks and leaves, and sprinkling earth over the hole. They build hut-like structures, and lay nuts or plantains beneath for the purpose of tempting chimpanzees, baboons, or other apes. A slight movement causes the hut to fall on the incautious animals. Bow traps are placed along the tracks of civets, ingenimoons, and rodents, which snap and strangle them. The pygmies do not hesitate to attack the elephant, spearing it from underneath and hunting it for its ivory, which they trade with the settled tribes. In short, they are of unsurpassed agility and are the best of woodsmen and hunters, their skill being taken advantage of by the settled tribes, who trade with them vegetables, tobacco, spears, knives, and arrows, for meat, honey, the feathers of birds, the ivory of the elephant, and other forest spoil. So destructive are they of game that they would soon denude the surrounding forest if they stayed long in one spot so that they are compelled to move frequently. Schweinfurth speaks of them as cruel and fond of tormenting animals. They serve the settled natives in other ways, acting as scouts and informing them of the coming of strangers while still distant. Every forest road runs through their camps, their villages command every crossway, and no movement can take place in the forest without their knowledge, while they are adept at the art of concealment. The superior woodcraft, the malicious disposition, and the poisoned arrows and good marksmanship of these forest folks make them formidable enemies, and the settled tribes hold them in dread and are glad to keep on good terms with them. Yet they find them much of a nuisance, since their dwarfish neighbors claim free access to their gardens and plantain fields, where they help themselves to fruit in return for small supplies of meat and furs. In short, they are human parasites on the larger natives who suffer from their extortions, yet fear to provoke their enmity. Burroughs says that they will never steal, but that they pay very inadequately for the plantains they take, leaving a very small package of meat in return for an ample supply of food. The pygmies build their camps two or three miles away from the Negro villages, living in groups of 60 to 80 families. A large clearing may have 8 to 12 of these pygmy camps around it, with perhaps 2,000 inmates. Their dwellings are the shape of an oval cut lengthwise and are built in a rude circle, the residence of the chief occupying the center. The doors are two or three feet high. On every track leading to the camp, at about 100 yards distance, is a sentry house large enough to hold two of the little folks, its doorway looking up the track from the camp. While wandering in the forest, they build the flimsiest of leaf shelters. The intelligence of the pygmies is of a very low order. In the arts which they have been developing for ages, they are experts. They are thoroughly familiar with the habits of animals, and as hunters they are unsurpassed. But in intellect they are decidedly lacking. They are destitute of agriculture, possess no animals except a few dogs, and have none of the elements of culture. The Bushmen, for instance, can count only up to two. All beyond that is many. Yet this low tribe of the desert nomads is, as we have said, skilled in the art of drawing, its sketches of men and animals being widely distributed through Cape Colony. The pygmies seem greatly lacking in the social sentiments. Burroughs, in his, quote, land of the pygmies, end quote, says that they do not possess even the most ordinary ties of family affection. Such common and natural feelings of affinity as those between mother and son, brother and sister, etc., seem to be wanting in them. It is a fact of great interest that the pygmy race does not seem confined to Africa, for tribes of men resembling the pygmies in stature and in various other particulars are found in widely removed localities such as Malacca, the Adaman Islands, and the Philippine Archipelago, while there are indications that they once spread widely over this island region of the earth. Those of the Philippines, known as Negritos, or Atas, have been somewhat closely observed and may be briefly described. 
The Negritos are similar in stature to the pygmies of Africa, the men averaging four feet eight inches high, and they are like them in general appearance. They are darker in complexion, some being as sable as Negroes, and all of them darker than the African pygmies. Their features are coarse and ill-shaped, their nose depressed, lips full, hair black and frizzled. In body, like the pygmies, they are thin and spindle-legged. The calf of the leg is not developed in any of these dwarfish people. The Negritos possess one marked and significant characteristic, the separation of the great toe. This, while it has not the full power of movement shown in the apes, is much more separated from the others than in the whites, and can be readily used in grasping. By its aid, the Negrito can not only pick up small objects, but can descend the rigging of a ship head downward, holding on like a monkey by his toes. It may be said that among uncivilized and barefoot people, the great toe is usually very mobile. The artisans of Bengal can weave, the Chinese boatman can row with its aid, and it aids much to facility in climbing. The Negritos wear little clothing, have no fixed abodes, and pass a wandering life in the forests, living on game, honey, wild fruits, roots of the arum, and other forest food. Their weapons consist of a bamboo lance, a bow of palm wood, and a quiver of poisoned arrows. It is certainly a striking fact that, wherever found from South Africa to the Far East, the pygmy tribes possess the art of poisoning their weapons. This art is not practiced by the surrounding peoples and is the strongest evidence of a community of origin. It seems to point back to a remote period when the pygmy peoples spread far through the tropics of the eastern hemisphere, though in the region now under consideration, they have almost vanished through the assaults of the Malays. The Negritos are very alert physically, being remarkably fleet of foot, while they can climb like monkeys. They live in groups of about 50 families, shelter being obtained by the simple erection of sloping poles and leaves though in their more settled locations they built bamboo huts like those of the Malays. They are a short-lived race, seldom living more than 40 years. Mentally they are stupid and apparently incapable of improvement, seeming to stand at the foot of the human scale. Attempts to instruct them have been made, but all proved failures. Efforts to make agriculturists of them have proved similarly futile. They are hereditary hunters, and hunters they are likely to remain. The only eastern locality of which the pygmy race remained in full possession until recent times is that of the Adaman Islands. This is no longer the case. Great Britain made a penal settlement of these islands after the mutiny in India, and as a consequence, the many Kopis, as their native inhabitants are called, have begun to disappear. These islanders are rather taller than the Philippine Negritos, ranging from four and a half to five feet in height, but otherwise there is a somewhat close resemblance between them. Their color is dark brown or black, their hair woolly, and inclined to grow in tufts, like that of the Bushman. The head, though large in proportion to the body, is really very small and of low cranial capacity. That of the men is only 1,244 cubic centimeters, as contrasted with 1,554 cubic centimeters of a large number of male Parisians measured by Broca. That of the women differs in the same proportion. Flower said that the Minicopes rank lowest among the human races in this respect, but it must be remembered that the brain usually decreases in size with decrease in stature. Small as these islanders are, however, their strength is relatively great. They use with ease bows which the strongest English sailors cannot string, though practice may have much to do with this facility, and they can send arrows with a force that seems out of accord with their size. Their agility is remarkable. Travelers speak of the speed of the bullet in describing their running, doubtless with some exaggeration. Their senses are strikingly acute, it is said they can distinguish fruits by their odor when hidden in the foliage of the jungle, and have wonderful powers of sight and hearing. 
as in the case of the ages, their life is short, though the age of puberty is nearly as great as with us. Fifty is extreme old age with these people, and twenty-two is said to be the average length of life. Mentally, they are at a low level, the lowest in the opinion of Owen among the races of mankind. In counting, they have words only for one and two, but can count up to ten by touching the nose with each of the fingers in succession, saying each time, quote, this one also, end quote. Their language is of a primitive type, and in various aspects they manifest low intelligence. Yet, as in the case of the Akas mentioned, they can be taught to the level of other children of 12 or 14 years. Their mind, in the opinion of Dr. Brander, seems rather to be asleep rather than incapable. One child was taught to read and write and to speak English fluently, and gained some knowledge of arithmetic, and this was not an exceptional case. It does not seem at all remarkable when we consider the ease with which monkeys can be taught many arts and acts new to them, that these dwarfish men, like other savages greatly superior as they are in brain power to the apes, should be capable of acquiring minor elements of education. It is not what they can be taught, but what they have taught themselves that we must consider in assigning them to their comparative place in intellectual development. In this respect, the Mincopies are on a very low plane. They have not even acquired the art of making a fire, though this is almost universal with mankind. All they know is how to keep a fire alive, and in this they are very assiduous. It is probable that they may have obtained fire at first from volcanoes on neighboring islands. They are lacking, like the pygmy races in general, in the art of chipping stone, one of the earliest arts acquired by man. Their only means of shaping stone is to put it into the fire until it breaks or splinters, when they can use the sharp splinters for their purposes. They are quite destitute of the art of drawing, and have no means of communicating their thoughts, except by speech. Yet with these deficiencies they have made some progress in the industrial arts. They make wooden vessels, and can produce pottery, which stands the fire, and in which they cook most of their food. They make nets of considerable size, which they use to fish with in narrow streams. They have arrows and harpoons, whose points are fastened to the shaft by a long cord. The fish or land animal struck unwinds this cord in trying to get away, and its speed being checked by the shaft which it drags along, it is easily caught. The Mincopies possess boats and these seem to have been early possessions of the Negrito populations, by whose aid they were able to migrate from island to island. Their canoes have nautical qualities which have astonished English sailors. At one time they were probably bold and daring fishermen and navigators, until driven to the forests and mountains by the invasion of the Malays. As the Pygmies were, in all probability, the aborigines of Africa, so the Negritos appear to have been the original aboriginal people, of the eastern islands, if not of India. Quatrefages in his work, quote, The Pygmies, end quote, finds reason to believe that even at the present day traces of them, pure or mixed, can be found from southeast New Guinea to the Adaman Islands, and from the Sunda Islands to Japan. On the continent, their range extends, according to him, quote, from Anam and the peninsula of Malacca to the western Gahuts, and from Cape Cormoran to the Himalayas, end quote. In one part of India, the Negrito-like population are called the Bander Lock, literally man-ape, by the neighboring tribes. The Samangs of Malacca are jet black in color, with thick lips, flat nose, and protruding abdomen. In regard to the characteristic of prognathism, it is possessed in various degrees, the most pronounced instance being seen in the photograph of one of the Kalangs of Java, a tribe which has recently become extinct. The face of this individual is strikingly ape-like in profile. Everywhere that these dwarfish people are found, whether in Africa, India, or Malaysia, they present the appearance of being an aboriginal race, now largely annihilated by the incursions of larger and better armed people, but once widespread and numerous. As to their place of origin, whether in Africa, India, 
or the island region it is useless to speculate as the facts on which an opinion could be based are not known wherever found they are in close relation to the black races the negroes of africa the papuans of polynesia and evidences of a considerable degree of mixture of races exist this is especially the case in polynesia and india where the negritos appear to shade off into the full-sized blacks through an intermediate series of half-breeds yet one fact of the ethnological importance needs to be mentioned the negritos and pygmies are everywhere brachycephalic or short-headed with the exception of the bushmen who are dolicephalic or partially so negroes and papuans are strongly diocephalic in this respect the pygmy peoples agree more closely with the short-headed mongolian or yellow races than with the long-headed negro or black races though in general features they come near the latter in truth this race of dwarfs may be the primitive stock from which the mongolians branched off on the one hand and the negroes on the other since they are in some measure intermediate between the two latham says of the rajmalis mountaineers quote, some say their physiognomy is mongolian others that it is african end quote quatrefages is strongly of the opinion that the negro is of indian origin and reached africa through migration he bases his opinion on the negroid characters of existing tribes in india persia and elsewhere in asia and on the similar characters of the aboriginal polynesians as regards the pygmies they probably spread over the whole of this section of the earth at a period of remote antiquity and very long ago developed the racial differences which appear to exist between separate tribes distinctions of this kind can be seen in the east and a marked one is pointed out by stanley between the wambudi and the akka as already stated wherever found the pygmies are hunters usually making the deep forest their home and are masters through their agility cunning and deadly weapons of the whole world of lower animals physically they are probably not far removed from the man-ape their remote ancestor for they retain various ape-like characters as in aspect of face shape of body occasional hairiness diminutive size shortness of legs imperfect development of the calf occasional waddling gait in walking and other particulars above pointed out there are certainly abundant reasons for believing them to be as we have suggested the final result of the first great conflict in the evolution of man that with lower animals this assured mastery once gained the occasion for further development of this people ceased while they remained in the forest habitat which they had inherited from their ape ancestors here the problem of food getting was fully solved and there was nothing to instigate any new step in evolution the period of conflict ended a period of rest supervened and so far as the pygmies are concerned this period still continues though later races their probable descendants have left the forest and set up new stages of development through new conflicts with adverse conditions the pygmies remain in their resting state and if left to themselves might continue in this state for ages in the future as they have done for ages in the past as the case now stands however annihilation threatens some of them while educative and other influences from without may bring an end to the physical and mental isolation of the others in considering the pygmies as they exist today in fact it is impossible to say how far their habits and possessions are original with themselves and how far they have been derived from others there can be no question that they have been influenced by the customs of surrounding peoples of higher culture and that they have received implements and methods from without to get down to the pure pygmy as an outcome of evolution within himself we would need to strip off all these adventurous aids if we could distinguish them from the conditions native to the race and thus behold him as he was before he fell under the influence of men of higher grade were it possible to isolate him in this way and present his original self 
we should have before us an ethnological specimen of the highest interest and importance as the ultimate result of the first great stage in the evolution of man from his ape ancestor. End of chapter 9 Recording by Tom Mack